Um, we'll try uh, to talk, uh, you know, uh, about the fractional flow reserve and whether we need to uh, expand its use in our, you know, uh, cat labs. Um, as I tell you, I mean, this morning, since the morning, I thought that I know about mitral valve disease. I'm more confused than ever, as <laughs> Dr. Lee said, after all of this talk. So let's switch gears and talk about something that we can understand. Okay. Fractional flow reserve is a simple concept, actually, where they look at the uh, maximum flow down a vessel in the presence of a stenosis. And they compare that theoretically to the flow when the stenosis is not present there. Of course, there is, you know, a complicated issue about the flow, but when they cancel all of these, you know, variables at the pressure distal to the stenosis over the pressure proximal to the stenosis will give you this fractional flow reserve. And this has been standardized, uh, and we'll talk in a second about the cutoff which they agreed on. Um, the technical aspect, it's a simple, actually, angioplasty wire with a sensor at the tip. So you don't really don't need to change it. You just go measure your pressure or fractional flow reserve and then decide whether you want to proceed with angioplasty, and then you can do it. So it does not really prolong the procedure much. Um, it's very safe, and as I mentioned here, it takes only a few minutes. Um, you have to achieve, however, something called hyperemia or maximum blood flow by vasodilating the coronary. And this is usually achieved by intravenous adenosine, you know, like this is the same dose which we use for stress testing or intracoronary bolus use, whether in the right or left coronary. Um, as you see here, typically this is, I mean, the vessels where we need to really um, look into this more. Dr. Gaz uh, Gazal showed a case and he said, is this significant or not? These are the ones where you need to, you know, know whether this is significant or not. If you look at I me mean, at this legion in the RCA and LED, I assume most of you agree, well, this is the same, almost very much similar, a moderate legion. Is it significant or not? But if you look at the FFR result here in the right, it's 0.85, and in the left, 0.68, which is severe, indicates severe ischemia. This is normal. So we know that angiography is a very crude way of looking at stenosis. You're looking at the 3D-dimensional structure in 2D. And for the validation, as you see here, when you use a cutoff of 0.8 for your FFR, it's almost the accuracy more than 90% and specificity more than 100% that this is ischemic. Occurrence of false negative and false positives are really rare, especially the false negatives. It's usually related um, to either pressure dampening related to your guiding catheter or failure to achieve maximal hyperemia. That means the patient may have taken, uh, you know, uh, caffeine or you have not given the right dose uh, to achieve that hyperemia. Less commonly in patients with ST elevation MI within there is significant microvascular dysfunction. You cannot achieve that, you know, and that will give you a false negative or false high FFR when the lesion is usually significant. For false positive, usually it's related to calibration, if anything. Why do we need FFR? It's important fact to know that most patients go to the cat lab and they don't have non-invasive evaluation, by the way. So if you have an invasive evaluation, that might have solved some of the issue. The second thing, the limitation of this non-invasive or, my, or myocardial perfusion imaging. Myocardial perfusion imaging lacks spatial resolution, means that you have ischemia in the LED territory. You go in there, there's two or three legions in the LED, which one to fix? or in patients with multivessel disease, ischemia showed you the most severe vessel in the myocardial perfusion. Then you find another lesion in the CERC, which looks also 50, 60, 70. Is that ischemic or not? So that's where we need to, you know, use this technique. When you compare the PIT-CT or, uh, you know, SPICT with FFR, as you see here, there is a problem with disco discordance you know, between the two techniques, as you see here. I mean, it's at most like 42% concordance. When you compare it, you know, to the angiography, which we're going to talk about the slide, there is a big problem there. So as you see here, the angiography was looked at actually in the FAME trial, where they looked at almost a little over 1,000 patients who had a multivessel disease, and they randomized them whether to go for angiography-guided PCI, as planned before, or to do an FFR, and then you guide, if the patient has less than 0.8, you will do the angioplasty. 
Is that safe to do? As you see here, the results for almost over a year, the patient who had an FFR-guided PCI did very well compared to the just angiography-guided PCI. And if they, you know, this is was achieved also at a cost of less stents. If you go with just angio-guided PCI, you used almost on average three stents, here around two stents. Less contrast, of course, cost was also uh, an issue. If you look at also other events, maze rate, you know, uh, survival, everything, it was looking good that, and safe to go with an FFR-guided uh, I mean, uh, technique. And it's also worth mentioning that one-fourth of the lesions were, which the operator said that this is significantly more than 70%, it tend to have normal or not normal, no significant FFR. What about the IVAS versus the FFR? We know that IVAS is an anatomical, and it's an excellent tool for vessel size and confirming this, the stent expansion and strut uh, opposition. It's, it's very, really very well for that. And in different or several trials, they looked at it. And the only correlation they found that if your minimal luminal area was more than four millimeters square, if it's less than that, the correlation was at best was only 50%. What about, shall we guide our PCI with an FFR? Is that a safe thing to do? The first trial which looked at patients who came with chest pain is the deferred trial, as you see here, around 300 patients. If your FFR less than 0.75 at that time, the cutoff, uh, they went for PCI. And the rest, around 180 patients, they said, we'll randomize them, half and half, whether we'll just proceed per angiography for PCI or just defer it, don't do it, since the uh, FFR is not significant. And did those people do well? Indeed. I mean, the FFR group did okay. It was safe to say, I mean, here up to almost two years. And then later, they followed them up to a five years. And as you see here, the, the deferred group had half the event rates. But you remember, the, the group was small. So that's why the p-value did not reach statistical significance. But it's half the event rates there. The second thing is that annual rates you know, annual cardiovascular rates were less than 1%, which is good. This is great. I mean, this is the best you can achieve with a modality. The second trial which they looked into this was the FAME2 trial. FAME2 trial, patients with stable coronary disease. And actually, interesting, this is sort of the, let's say, refining the courage trial. Patients with stable coronary disease who were, had an angiography and they were planned to go for a PCI. And then they looked into this, as you see here, whether your FFR less than 0.8, they, uh, they were randomized to go for FFR-guided PCI plus optimal medical therapy or optimal medical therapy alone, or actually there was a registry around 330 patients where they found that their FFR was, none of the lesions was less than 0.8, so they called them the registry, and they followed them up. And guess what? This trial was terminated prematurely because of the in-between the group differences. The patient who had significant FFR and did not go for angioplasty, look at this, the, more, I mean, the MACE rate was significantly high. And that's why the trial was terminated prematurely. This was mostly driven by the need for urgent revascularization. The patient with the, def I mean, the registry group did as good. So those are patients which they told that they have legions and they wanted to go for PCR. What about looking at left main stenosis? Again, we just say interventionalist, I mean, we look at them, we're really not the best people, maybe, or we're not, I mean, we're not good at least engaging which legion is significant or not. As you see here in a trial by Hamlus and his colleagues, over 200 patients, they thought that they have a moderate left main disease. When they did the FFR, more than half did not have significant lesions. They followed these people clinically. Did they do well? Over almost five years, they did well. If they did not even intervene on them, they did well. So it's safe to follow that st strategy. What about for risk stratification? You know the Syntex score, Dr. Waqar yesterday talked about the Syntex score and looking, you know, the higher your Syntex score, you're served better with cabbage. The lower maybe you can go to angioplasty. Could we refine that score? They did, actually. It was called functional syntax score. It's part of the FAME trial, a subgroup of the FAME trial, which I showed earlier. 
they looked at them. And this is how the patients were, you know, classified by the Syntec score, you know, whether low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And guess what? Almost more than one third of the group who were classified as moderate high risk were re reclassified as a low risk. So those patients could be served, you know, without the need to go for the, as Dr. Waqar showed you, the ugly, that deep uh, wound infection and, you know, bypass. And also look at outcome. If you look at the, just here, death or MI, actually the regulars or the classic syntax score did not differentiate. The p-value was not significant, but the functional syntax score showed significant difference between the low and the high risk group. And the same here for you, just if you look at MACE, both showed, but the difference was, was, most, uh, was more robust with the functional syntax score. Could we help our you know, colleagues, the surgeons, with that? Same thing here. They looked at patients who were going for cabbage. And when you look at the patients who were classified by FFR, the multivessel disease was reduced from 94 to almost 86%. And the number of grafts needed were definitely different. The patients who went for FFR required less graft, single graft, double graft. Was that safe? The first thing we ask about, was that safe? Was that right? If you look at it, of course, all the, the maze and even individual endpoints were the same for those patients who were guided, who had less grafts. And even, I tell you a little more, you will be happy to see that at the end of follow-up, patients who were FFR guided had less angina. Okay, and even to make it better, graft patency was better on those patients because we know long time ago that if you put a graft on a vessel with no limited flow, it will close. So those patients had a better patency of their grafts. Second thing is, could we also refine our PCI? I mean, you're doing a PCI on a legion. If you do a, an FFR post your PCI, would you be able to tell that you did a great job, or you did a good job, or you did not do a good job? Indeed, uh, Dr. Pigel published this in the circulation 2002, and it's quite interesting. If you reduced your FFR post-procedure, and you made it above 90. Look at the event rates, five to six percent. Of course, if you're more than 95, you did very well. If you make it to 90, six percent. But look at this, if you really stayed below 90, event rate 16 percent goes up to 30 percent if you're below 80. So it's a great tool for, you know, telling you, you know, how is your patients gonna do post-PCI too? Because we have a lot of difficult lesions where you cannot really achieve the perfect PCI. And as you see here, when they looked at the multivariate analysis, independent of the other variables, FFR and the length of the stint, the only two things that stuck and they were significant. What about the side branch? You know, we deal with this a lot. Dr. Also Gazal showed a case where he said, I wasn't worried about that side branch. I mean, most of the side branch lesion, if the ostium was diseased pre, they look very ugly. But does that mean that they have significant stenosis after? As you see here, in most, actually, only one quarter of the ones which look that they have more than 75% stenosis after you place the stent in the main vessel had an FFR of less than 0.75. The ones which look less than that, almost zero. None of them had significant stenosis or FFR. So you don't need to prolong the procedure and deform the stent in the main vessel and, you know, give more contrast, cause more trouble. You just leave those alone. And you know that. We've demonstrated that if your FFR is more than, you know, the 0.8, then you're fine. Next thing, let's talk about just two or three challenges to this. Now, what about if you have a serial stenosis in the vessel? Can, I mean, checking FFR for each legion separate, would that give you an accurate number? No, actually, because the legion downstream or upstream will affect the FFR of the other legion. However, there is a complicated formula which has been standardized and it can give you really the, uh, the, uh, the accurate or very, I mean accurate, very close number to when you do, uh, when you fix one of those legions. However, as you see, it's very complicated. It, you have to measure something called the winch pressure, which is you inflate the balloon in the distal legion and measure the pressure from the collaterals and that's the, what's called here wedge. It's really complicated. But we have an easier way to do it. We can do just something called pullback. You just put the wire distal to the legion, and then if the FFR is significant for both legions, then that's ischemic. You have to do something. And look at the pressure drop here. 
You see which legion gives you more pressure drop, and then you go start with it and fix it. And then you measure across the other one. And mostly, the FFR will be worse after you fix one of those legions. So you uncover that one. And let me show you this example, actually, very interesting. Again, an RCA with two legions. As you see here, the pressure drop was more in the distal legion. So they went, and as you see here, the proximal legion, it has a predicted value of uh, actually 0.74 using that equation, but the measured or the apparent was 0.88 because there is a distal legion which is causing more problems. Okay, so when they did it, they fixed the proximal legion. As you see here, the pressure drop went down very, very much. And then the proximal, now the measured FFR was 0.75, which is very close to what we predicted from the formula. So that tells you that that formula can be used. It's really very much predictable. And they went ahead and fixed the second legion. And as you see, the pressure drop across the distal legion was almost close to zero. And there was only 10 millimeter in the proximal legion. The final FFR was not perfect, but it's 0.84. So this is a, an easy way to go around it. What about in diffuse disease? In diffuse disease, you see this tapering. Really, there is no major pressure drop. So there is no really focal legion to go and fix, unfortunately. What about if you have a lift main, a moderate legion in the lift main, and downstream stenosis in the CERC or LAD? This also affects your measurement. And however, if you see the measurement, I mean, they, they did this, I mean, very uh, elegant study where they looked at stenosis in that legion, and they inflated, you know, after they fixed that legion, they put a balloon and they inflated maybe a little bit just to create that stenosis again. And they noticed that the change, actually, the, the absolute number change is 0.02 only. So it, it, it did reach statistical significance, but it's really not a big number. And that's why they said, you know, measure your FFR in the non-diseased vessel. If it's less than 0.8, then this is significant. If it is more than 0.85, then that's not significant. If it is between 0.81 and 0.85, then measure something called FFF, uh, FFR epicardial, which is you put the wire distal to the legion in the diseased vessel. If it's less than 0.45, then both legions are significant. So this is the recommendation for that, to overcome. So let's go back to the last two slides. Why should we use FFR then, after we all, all what we said? It's quite accurate, and it's ex extremely reproducible. This is the beautiful thing about it. It's independent of hemodynamics. You can give nitroprocide, you can give merinone, you can give dopamine. It does not change. Superb spatial resolution. Now, you have multiple legions or multivessel disease. You can specify which legion you need to fix without putting in a uh, stents. Of course, it accounts for collateral flow. This is interesting. If you have a legion which is moderate in one vessel, which is supplying collaterals to other vessel, it will account for that flow. Even if that legion is not severe, the FFR will be significant because it's feeding two territories. Of course, it's safe. Cost reduction we saw with the stent, with the contra contrast, with the time of the procedure. Better and complete relief of ischemia, we saw that with post-PCI and post-cabbage. And for risk stratification, we saw that with the functional syntax score. So, conclusion now is, should we use FFR in all patients? No. I mean, we, this is the short answer. But if you have a patient with typical chest pain, single vessel disease, he had a stress test, which showed that, let's say, LAD is the cause of ischemia, then you just go fix it. You don't need to do FFR. If you have an MI and a single vessel, significant single vessel disease, you don't need an FFR. But more, the vast majority of cases, they come to the cat lab without a non-invasive testing, or if they have discordant measurements or values, then that's where you really need to do, use it. And as we see in these scenarios, there is a, now a wealth of data supporting the routine measurement of FFR and to guide our PCI with it. Thank you very much, and have a good day.